but an immersive storytelling. Uh, we're seeing a lot of this uh, really popping up all over the world, right? Where you can go into a place and suspend your disbelief, meaning that you for that moment, feel like you're in that world, in that place that the creator has created, you know, for you. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Margaret Carrison. How you doing, Margaret? Hi. How are you, Alex? Thanks for having me on your show. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm like I was telling you earlier, I'm excited to talk to you. I've never spoken to an Imagineer before, uh, a former Imagineer, former Imagineer, correct. former Imagineer, <laughs> but you worked with, with Disney as an Imagineer for so long. And there's so much myth and mystery behind that. That's that kind of um, position that Walt, you know, created all those yeah. years ago. So we'll talk a little bit about that and about your new book, um, the immer- immersive storytelling and all of that. So first, first question, how did you get into this business? Oh, wow. That's uh, it's such a huge question, but I think I always want to start it with the fact that, um, you know, I always wrote all my life. I always created things. I've always loved to tell stories in every kind of medium. Like I was that kid who was making like finger puppets and like casting my family and friends into my own like skits on my like huge camcorder at home and everything. And I never really thought about it, uh, writing that is, and storytelling as a professional career because um, I didn't see that many role models growing up who were who were in that creative field. And, you know, I was born in Indonesia and I grew up in Singapore and At the time, like the creative field wasn't really that flourishing or anything like that, especially in Singapore. And when I moved to the United States for college, um, I was exposed to a lot more, you know, writing classes and creative classes and just movies and TV in general, which I have always loved. So I had one, uh, I, I did a screenwriting certificate course at Emerson College, and there was a professor there who encouraged me to apply to film school and he had gone to usc and he you know spoke all really great things about it and he's like you should really think about applying to film school not specifically to usc but i did apply to usc i got waitlisted the first year but got accepted the following year and from there you know i was taking mostly writing courses for film and tv And I didn't know about this whole world of themed entertainment. I didn't even know about the word Imagineering until in my like early 20s, you know, and I went to Disneyland, all of that stuff. But I just didn't know that there were these magicians, these people behind the curtains doing this kind of work. And so it was really my thesis professor at the time, you know, she was talking to us about like, you writers need to think about different industries to get into, not just film and TV. They need writers for games. They need writers for roller coasters. And she was going on and on. But I remember just pausing and being like, they need writers for roller coasters? Like, who does that? That sounds awesome. That sounds like something I totally want to do. And that night, you know, I was just searching on the web, like all kinds of information about like, what does that mean? Creating writing for themed entertainment and everything. And I was basically just sending emails to people, to the companies uh, based in LA and introducing myself and uh, trying to get into the, my foot into the door. And so one of those companies uh, got back to me and that's BRC Imagination Arts in Burbank. And I met with the founder, Bob Rogers, as well as a handful of other people. And they were really, really receptive and open to having someone like me come in. Um, And especially they're very, very, um, you know, they love having writers and working with writers and everything. So it was that was really my first professional job into this world. It was a lot of museum design. I worked on like um, experience centers for like Heineken um, and a cosmetic company named Amore Pacific. But it opened up my world to this possibility of telling stories using all of your senses. You know, it's not just looking at watching a story unfold on screen. It was really experiencing it and feeling it and being immersed in that story 
of a place. It's really interesting because as you're telling this story, I mean, I mean, obviously I've been to Disney World a million times. I've been to Disneyland and, and Universal and all these kind of stuff. And when you're in these kind of rides, as a writer, someone had to sit down and go, okay, when the ride gets to this point or when the audience gets to this point, this maybe the smell comes up, maybe this this water comes up, the heat pops up over here, a light pops up over there. So it's a lot there's a there's a lot more thought in it. So it seems more complicated than just writing a narrative screenplay, which is as difficult as you can get in the writing arts. Oh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Screen, screenwriting yeah. is the toughest thing you could do. It so I is. can imagine this is another level even harder almost. Yeah, it is uh challenging because you know you really have to work as a team. I think a lot of uh writing, at least in my experience, screenwriting, because I had, you know, helped to write um, feature film scripts for independent directors and also for children's animation and all of this. It's really a very solitary craft for the most part. I'm sitting with my laptop, I'm writing, I occasionally get notes, occasionally have meetings. But writing for immersive storytelling and for themed entertainment in general, experiential design, uh, there's so many different names for it. And that you really, you have to work together with all the various disciplines to figure out how you're able to tell that story and share that story in all of these different um, disciplines, you know, everything from graphics to media, to architecture, to what you're eating in the experience, what you're hearing, what you're smelling, what you're sensing, who, the characters you're meeting, all of that, right? You have to work hand in hand with a talented group of people who are experts in the various fields that they're working on. And being able to be the story champion, uh, to really kind of rally everyone together to make sure they're building the same world, the same thing, uh, the same story, the same context to all of these, to whatever story you're working on, that's the challenge. And it's tough because, you know, as artists, as creatives, we all have our different interpretations of what that story can be. And so being this, um, you know, world builder, storyteller, you really have to ensure that everyone is aligned to that creative intent and making sure that you're all building the same place. So that's really the challenge of it is really how do you work as a team to move forward together and to really think about, you know, what is that heart and soul of a place and how does that manifest into design, into music, into words, into graphics, into moving media, all of these things. It's it's one big orchestra, you know, for lack of a better analogy. It's how do you how do you have all these different instruments come together to make this beautiful symphony? Is it is it kind of like working in a writer's room? Because at the writer's room has very similar ideas to that. Like everyone's got to be together. There's one person who's leading the charge, the showrunner, and everyone's there to service that show or that vision and kind of working. Is it kind of like that? It's so different. It's is so it? different because in a writer's room, it's mostly writers or people yeah. who are oh. have a very strong understanding of story. And sometimes you're going to work with people who don't have a good or strong understanding of story, right? So I think that, uh, you know, in a writer's room, you typically do have a showrunner with a ton of writers who are, you know, throwing out ideas and all of that stuff. It's never that, it's never that simple. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of um, trying to, um, you know, gather people or meet with people individually, um, trying to uh, socialize an idea by, you know, there's no one process or anything like that in that is like a tried and true method. And I think like in writing my book, even I try to, you know, uh, simplify as much as possible what would go on in that process. But ultimately, every project is different. Every team is different, De depending on the scope of your project, too. If you're working on a smaller museum versus a 16 acre land, um, you know, that's going to be that's going to be very different. Right. So I think that um, ultimately you have to have this open communication in order to, you know, make that plan, 
set up that strategy and it involves a lot of people coming together, you know, holding hands and marching together <laughs> towards towards the finish line. So so then how did you get involved with uh, Disney and, and becoming an Imagineer? And first of all, what is the definition of an Imagine Disney Imagineer? A Disney Imagineer is, uh, you know, Walt Disney had created this word of imagination and engineering and put it together to make up this new word of Imagineer, because really it's a combination of art, science and technology, innovation, always pushing the boundaries and always trying to find new magical ways to surprise and delight people. And there was no greater master storyteller than Walt Disney himself. I mean, he was such a visionary. Um, He really thought about, you know, the different ways that people can feel like they're immersed or participate in a story without merely watching, right? Like the story of him sitting in the park bench, watching his daughter uh, ride the carousel in Griffith Park and how he was thinking about how do I take part in that? Why am I just sitting here? Why can't I be involved in that too? And why can't I participate and engage in play with my children? You know, so I think that um, Imagineering and Imagineers in general, they are really, they come from all kinds of disciplines. So you have uh, people, you know, architects to, you know, audio engineers, to writers, to creative directors, producers, everyone that makes all of the various um, products and experiences for the Disney parks, resorts, cruise lines, um, all of the wonderful things that you experience in any of the parks and resorts and cruise lines. So it's a really cool job. It's, uh, you know, I spent seven years at Imagineering and met some of the best, most talented people ever in the industry. And it was really, you know, in seven years, I felt like it was a master class in everything, in um environmental storytelling and how to work as a team um, in really working with some of the greatest IP on earth and trying to, you know, adapt that, that into a story world in which other people can experience it. So it was uh, a very, very magical <laughs> journey for me, you know, for lack of a better word. And I think that it's something that, you um, I can see, you know, a lot of people having ideas of like what Imagineering is, you know, before they come in to experience what that's really like. But ultimately, it's a lot of work. You know, oh. it's a lot of work and there's a lot of fun and play in it, too. But we take that play very seriously. Without question, which I have to I have to ask you being a uh, a massive Star Wars fan. Uh, and you got to play you got to play in you got to play oh in yeah you got oh, to play yeah. in that in that playground and oh yeah what I an mean, honor oh my gosh i mean so it you was... worked on galaxy's edge which uh, i haven't had a chance to go to galaxy's edge yet mm-hmm. I did, because of the pandemic and all that stuff i haven't gotten there yet um but many of my friends have and and, and i've seen obviously videos and images of it what was what, what you were a story consultant on that right no, I was uh, I was working full time at Imagineering, so I was uh, the story lead for right. the um, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, and I was uh, I worked on a whole everything Star Wars um, for in my time there. So my first uh, project was uh, Star Wars Launch Bay, which was um, in both Disneyland and in Disney Hollywood Studios. Uh, worked on Hyperspace Mountain, worked on uh, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, worked on Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser all the Star Wars activations on all the um, cruise lines as well. So I pretty much had a, you know, the privilege of a lifetime working with uh, Luke, our Lucasfilm partners who are amazing. I mean, they really set the bar really, really high for us. And we did not take that lightly at all. You know, when I, uh, I remember one of the very first meetings for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And we had, you know, turned to the Lucasfilm story group and asked, you know, what kind of stories are they expecting from us and all of this? And I remember um, Pablo Hidalgo, who's one of the executives on the story group was saying, you know what, we haven't told all the stories in Star Wars. So we'd like to hear from you what you think the stories should be. And that was really empowering to hear that, you know? And I think that that that's really, um, the 
the magic of uh, being a Star Wars fan is that, you know, you have this like uh, great, you know, power responsibility to carry that torch um, and try to really figure out a way to understand like what made Star Wars Star Wars, you know, what made people um, over the decades, you know, come back to it time and time again. And George Lucas, you know, you can't talk about Star Wars without talking about George Lucas and what a powerful story he had created and touched so many lives, generations of people, you know, I was an eighties kid. So, you Mm -hmm. know, I grew up with the original trilogy and all of that stuff and the power and the magnitude and the cultural phenomenon that is star Wars and how that is integrated into everything in our lives, you know, 40 plus years later, people are still saying may the force with be with you and everything like that. Right. Like it is part of our uh, society. Like if you you don't know star Wars, I don't know where you've been living, you know, your whole life. At one point, even if you haven't seen the movies, you've heard of star Wars. Exactly. You know what the force is. You might know what Yoda is. You probably know who Baby Yoda is, even though it's grow, grow, grow. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Um, no, that must have been so much fun working in that world. Oh, it was amazing. In, in, in a, and it's, and it's in a different scope than a John Favre or a Dave Filone or any of these other creators are doing because you're you 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 get to actually build the universe that people get to walk in and and things that we've seen on on screen for so many years. You get to walk into a cantina. Yeah, you get to, you get to see the Millennium Falcon. You get to, so it, it must have been uh, as immersive. You must have been geeking out for years. Oh <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. I mean, you know, we started off talking about that bucket list of all the things that we wanted to do as Star Wars fans, and the amazing part was in our team there were like the people who really knew very little about Star Wars. They don't know the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek. And then you have the people on the other end of the spectrum who read, you know, Arabish. And they were our basically our resident Star Wars expert, right? And everyone in between. So I think that it was so neat to work as a team to talk about well, what is the bucket list for all the things that you want to do in Star Wars? The cantina was way high up, right? Like, oh, yeah. we want to go to the cantina. We want to, um, you know, not only ride the Millennium Falcon, but pilot it. Uh, we want to be in an epic battle between the, you know, the light side and dark side. At the time, we didn't even know about First Order or any of that stuff, right? We didn't know about Kylo Ren. When we were starting this process, you have to remember that, like, there was no The Force Awakens, and it was very top secret, you know. And so we only got little tidbits of what was coming, but we always knew, like, okay, if we don't have the details of what The Force Awakens was going to be about, what do we know about Star Wars that will always be true? There's going to be droids. There's going to be awesome ships. There's going to be species, aliens, you know, walking around. There's going to be the light side, the dark side, Jedi, you know, Sith, all of that, right? The light side, dark side, the force, everything. So that was, it. we had a lot to work with, but we didn't have like specific details until, you know, pretty like maybe a few months, a year into the project as we're building it. And from there, we had to be flexible enough to say, okay, it has to be this era, you know, it has to be these characters, all of that stuff, right? Like we had to work closely with Lucasfilm to do that because we couldn't just do whatever we wanted. I mean, we right. had to make sure that everything was in canon, everything was going to be, um, you know, in evolve the stories and the, you know, the brand, the franchise, all of these things. So we had a really, really huge responsibility that was a great honor and privilege. But boy, was that a lot of pressure on oh, us. I can- I can't, even, I can't even imagine. By the way, did you ever get to meet George? No, I didn't. No. But you know what? It's funny because uh, I had I had seen him before when I was an intern a long time ago. Um, but I never got to see George because he wasn't, uh, you know, involved in the creation of the land or anything like that. Sure, sure, sure. By then he had, you know, sold Lucasfilm for billions of dollars, all of that stuff. So he did come to visit um, when we opened the land and everything, but no, he wasn't part of the process in a direct way. 
Yeah. Oh my God. I got to meet him. <laughs> one. I got to meet him once. Oh, yeah. did you? <laughs> and you know what it was? And, and he was next door to me in Burbank having lunch. No way. And I'm wow. like, why is he in a Burbank? It was right before the sale, <laughs> before anyone knew about the sale. So he was oh. he was he was meeting at Disney and he's just having lunch next door. And I had a I had just happened to have a Star Wars lunchbox that I got autographed. <laughs> But anyway, I, that's how much of it. Did you ask him to autograph your lunchbox? I, 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 I actually didn't have the, I didn't have the, um, the cojones to do it. So I had the receptionist, the older receptionist, walk up to him and ask him to make it out to me. Oh, I knew because that's I knew amazing. He, because I knew he wouldn't see, he'd see me coming a mile away, but he wouldn't see her coming. Ah, oh, that's like smart. 60, he was like 65. <laughs> like this, obviously this woman's not going to bother me. And then. Mr. Lucas, my friend over there, he he has a lunchbox. Would you just sign it? Would you oh, know? wow. And, his, and it was his daughter. He's like, Dad, sign it. And, that's <laughs> how, and I go, make it out to me because I'm never selling it. Uh, so that's my that's my quick George Lucas story. But yeah. I mean, Women save the day for you. The receptionist oh, and the daughter. Oh absolutely. God, I love it. <laughs> I've been surrounded by women my entire life. I have no testosterone in my house at all. Uh, all I have is women everywhere. Constantly. My daughters and my wife. and I uh, love it. <laughs> so, love it. so you have so you have this new book uh, about immersive storytelling. What is immersive storytelling, and how can it be used in the screenwriting and television work? Because not many, not many people are going to have the opportunity to tell the kind of stories you were telling with, yeah. with Star Wars and that kind of stuff. But what lessons can are, can you pull out of that to to apply to television and, and feature films? Yeah, you know, immersive storytelling is such a broad term to encompass this idea that you want to be able to tell a story in a medium that you can experience. And that meaning that you're you as a visitor, as an audience member are part of that story because in a lot of the traditional media, which I love, by the way, you know, reading books and watching film and TV and all of that stuff, you don't have a part to play in that story. You're uh, pretty much a passive uh, observer viewer of those stories, but an immersive storytelling uh, we're seeing a lot of this uh, really popping up all over the world, right? Where you can go into a place and suspend your disbelief, meaning that you, for that moment, feel like you're in that world, in that place that the creator has created you know, for you. And this creator storyteller is using different tools and techniques in order to make you believe that you're in that place, that you are present and in that moment. And I think some of the most powerful immersive storytelling are the ones that transport you into that world. And so there's so many different examples of that, right? There's really, you know, tiny museums or galleries or even stores, retail stores that does that. When you walk in, you're like, holy moly, what is this place, right? Immediately, you're transported into a different dimension. And then there's some that you go into, you know, that are places for you to explore and to discover. And so I use a lot of different examples in my book, everything from the museums to the really, you know, epic theme park lands and attractions sort of thing, and everything in between. Because I think that there isn't any one true uh, model per se of like, this is what immersive storytelling should be. Because I think once we can define the optimal or you know the the peak of that experience i think we we would have failed i think we always can need to continually develop and evolve what that means and i think that now with a lot of various organizations and companies trying to figure out like how do we blur you know um the real versus the virtual and digital and all of this stuff i think there's going to be an even bigger, broader meaning of what immersive storytelling is. But ultimately, it is a, a place for you to physically be present and to feel transported into a whole other world and to be able to use all of your senses as a human being to understand what is real to you. Because what is real besides your own you building your perception of reality, right? Mm -hmm. Everything from VR to AR to real life experiences where there's nothing virtual or digital, anything virtual or digital about it. So, you know, even when I'm thinking about like talking about real and imagined worlds, um, sometimes they're one and the same, I feel. So I think that it's a really great opportunity for future 
storytellers and the next generation of storytellers to think about how they can really push that. Because can you imagine even a few decades ago, a couple of decades ago, we can't even imagine being able to do something like this, right? <laughs> like you and I talking, you know, uh, in real time and being able to see each other and see and hear each other uh, in real time in, in such a way. And who knows, five years, 10 years from now, what could that mean, you know, uh, to be able to do something that is, uh, you know, being present with someone else, something that's social, something that is emotional as well. Um, How do you think about telling stories in an immersive way that touches upon all of those things? So what are the different kinds of immersive storytelling? Oh my goodness. I mean, just a handful, there's... just a couple. Just a couple. <laughs> it's a thousand, I know, but just a couple, just a couple. I mean, everything from, you know, it's funny because like people would argue that reading a book is immersive. If you're a very if you're really into a book, right? You can fully immerse yourself in it. You can forget mm-hmm. about, you know, time goes by, right? So, I think that there it just really depends on how you define it. But I think that um You know, everything from really cool museums, like I think about one of the examples that I uh, brought up in my book was the um, the National Museum of African-American History in Washington, D.C., and going through that experience and feeling completely immersed in that, starting from the bowels of a slave ship and rising up and just going from floor to floor to floor and climbing up to that, to experience that entire history and ultimately realizing that American history is African-American history. So going through something like that was extremely, you know, immersive for someone like me. And I think it's very, you know, subjective for a lot of people, right? Some people might feel differently about what's immersive and what's not. So museums to me are extremely immersive. I mean, there's examples that we're seeing with places like Meow Wolf, you know, where they have a whole bunch, it's an artist collective um, where they're creating a place where you can play and engage and go down slides. There's the the first one was House of Eternal Return in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, There's another one in Vegas and another one in Denver, Colorado, and one coming out in, I believe, Austin, Texas. And it's a playground for all ages, basically, right? You can let loose, you can interact with things, you can um, go explore these really bizarre rooms that at first uh, sight may not have any meaning, but then as you go through and do their little games and interactives, um, you uncover and discover all of these things that are just kind of a layer underneath what you thought was you know, your perception of the world. And then you uncover that there's something hidden all along, right? What's really interesting about what you're talking about is that for so many people listening, you know, they think that screenwriting a movie, you know, writing a movie or writing a television in television, the only two ways that you can write in entertainment. Many, you know, uh, I, a while ago, I had a video game writer on, which was a mm-hmm. fascinating conversation how that I mean, I'm like, how big is the script? They're like, it's six feet tall. Like, what do you mean six <laughs> feet tall? It goes literally the six feet from the ground all the way up of papers. And that's yeah. the script. It's like, I'm like, what? And so so there are other ways to do it. And I'd have to imagine that there is less competition in this space than there is in the screenwriting television space, but probably less opportunities as well. Is that a fair statement? Hmm. What do you think? I don't know if there's less competition. I think there's, uh, you know, there's always a, it's a very small world, this whole industry. And I think there's always this healthy competition of wanting, you know, whatever, the competitive company or theme park, whatever it is, right? Like we never had any ill feelings towards someone who would open an experience that's truly immersive because that, that, challenges us to be better. And for people who are really interested in this kind of immersive storytelling industry, I think that that healthy competition is very good. Oftentimes these companies collaborate with each other too. Right. So I don't think it's it's a, this fierce, you know, dog eat dog like competition or anything like that. I think that, you know, uh, when I was an Imagineer and went to Harry Potter, the wizarding world of Harry Potter for the first time, I was so impressed. 
And I even mention it in my book as one of the examples of really excellent immersive storytelling. So for me, as a fan of immersive experiences, I want more and more and more of it. And not only that, I want a variety of it too, from the really small experiences to the really epic ones. So for me, I think that, um, yes, it is. there is a healthy competition between all of these, between all the companies that work in this field. But I also think that there are opportunities, but it's probably not as mainstream as like thinking about like, right. oh, try going Maybe for so. the writing job in gaming or film or TV, because oftentimes these listings or these job postings aren't posted. Um, and it's a lot of word of mouth. And it's all a lot about relationships and networking mm -hmm. and working with the smaller companies first or a consultant, you know, and then moving yourself up from there. So it's not as easy, I would say, to get into that door, but that's changing because there's a lot of colleges and universities now that are offering programs in themed entertainment. And so there is this understanding or appreciation for the fact that our kind of work is very nuanced and very, um, you know, it's, it's, it's different in that you have to think about storytelling in a holistic, multi-sensory mm -hmm. type of perspective rather than writing words on a page and handing it off to someone who'll do who knows what with it right so um i think that it's a lot more of a collaborative uh um industry that you're looking into so what tips do you have for writers <clears throat> trying to create worlds in their stories regardless of the story are there any tips or ideas or things that you can tell them about how to move from just telling a story to creating worlds. I mean, George uh, Lucas was he's the master of that. Walt Disney was a master of that. Yeah. Um, because when you create a world, it's it, it just goes on. And it starts, I mean, Jean, John, uh, Gene Ronderberry was, was uh, you know, famous for that, obviously, as well. So how do you have any advice for, for screenwriters? You know, I think that um, my main thing is always the question of why are you telling this story? And why are you the best person to tell this story? And, you know, with all of the other things aside of like, of course, you want it to be fun and like you want it to be engaging and all of that stuff. I think those are the two important questions that I always ask whenever I go into any project is why should I care? You know, because like me, the creator storyteller, if I don't care and I'm right. writing this or creating, helping to create this, then no one's going to care. Because, you know, as human beings, we empathize with um, any sort of universal human truths. And George Lucas knew that well when he was creating Star Wars, right? He knew about, you know, there, there's, it's very Shakespearean, you know, like Star Wars about how, oh my gosh, the, the villain this whole time was my dad. Like it's so what? Shakespearean, Spoiler. you know? Spoiler alert, <laughs> wait a minute. Sorry, sorry to spoil it for you, um, you know? But it's that sort of thing that like, it's always these universal themes and these universal human truths. So that's now like, you know, only in the past few years do I really understand when people say, write what you know. and all the feelings, all the emotions, the, the stories that have happened to you, like how do you take all of that and bring it into the stories that you're helping to create, right? Because if you're just, um, you know, taking a template of something else or, or, you know, you watch something or you experience something, oh yeah, let's do that and let's do it our way sort of thing. It doesn't feel true. It doesn't feel genuine. And so that's kind of my advice to screenwriters is whenever you write your story or script, like ask that question of like, why are you telling the story? Why should you care? Because that's going to, you know, um, influence why other people should care. And what's that universal truth or theme that everyone can resonate with that doesn't feel like it's superficial, that doesn't feel like it's, um, you know, something you've seen or heard of before, you know, you want to be as um, unique and as personal as possible, you know, like when I talk to or read sometimes writing samples from writers and it's very, it, it you can tell that there's a lot of influences from other movies or, you know, scripts mm -hmm. and things like that, right? It's just the same thing over and over again. And I think there's a lot of fear and insecurity as a writer to want to expose that deeper side of you 
And a lot of the times I think about it, I'm like, you know what? I think as a as a writer, you have to write about your traumas. You have to write about the things that um, mm-hmm. you know killed you inside, that disturbed you, that really bothered you, that really hurt you. You know, um, and in addition to the traumas, you also write about your triumphs, right? You write about the things that like you started really low and you worked yourself up to being able to succeed in the end. So what are those cases or situations or scenarios in your life where you went from that trauma to triumph, right? And that's a character arc, arc. that's a story arc. How do people transform and change in your story? Because no one wants to cheer for someone who has it all in the beginning of the story, right? Unless the story is about a person who has it all and then loses everything in the end. Mm -hmm. But what is that arc when you're thinking about it? And so I think that really drawing upon your own personal experiences and really going there, you know, all the, the really uncomfortable places, the places that you think that no one would understand, believe me, people will understand, especially if it's more specific and more personal to you. Um, I think that there's going to be, you'll be surprised to find out that there's going to be a lot of people who feel like, holy cow, like, I totally resonate with that. You know, I know what it's like to, you know, be a parent in that situation or a child in that situation or friend or whatever it is, right? So, um, yeah. Even Star it. even Star Wars had George Lucas, it was, it was about his father. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it was, exactly. It was, it was about his relationship with his father, right? And so, and, and to a certain way, and uh, you know, after speaking to so many different successful writers and directors, I, I realized that years ago that I realized that the thing that makes them all successful is that they are able to tap into their own unique uniqueness, their own secret sauce, as I call it, that nobody else has. I mean, Tarantino is a secret mm-hmm. sauce as you get. There's nobody else on the planet. He's not trying to write like somebody else. Many other nope. people are trying to write like him. Right. <laughs> you know, um, I Nolan? remember. Yeah. No, what's the, who is Chris it? Nolan. Chris Nolan. Oh, Chris. I mean, oh, gosh. You're you're mentioning all of my heroes. You know? I mean, <laughs> I mean, who can write like Chris Nolan? Like, there's yeah. nobody else on the planet. Really? Maybe his brother because they write <laughs> together. But there's his, there's such a unique perspective yes. that comes from them. And that goes for directors as well as writers. Oh, but definitely. You have to be brave enough to be you there. You have to be brave. And. You know, that's uh, a lot of the times, you know, I remember watching Pulp Fiction for the first time when I was in high school and I was floored. I didn't know what was going on and what is this? Like, you know, I know this is a movie, but what is this? Like this format, this nonlinear storytelling. And there have been nonlinear storytelling before, you know, Citizen Kane, all of that. Right. But there was such a fresh, unique perspective to it. And the characters that he wrote that are so unique and so interesting, right? At the end of the day, they're interesting people um, with interesting problems. And you're rooting for them as as despicable as some of those characters are, you know, you're you you can't help but uh kind of explore what that it's you know, not everyone's just you know, it it isn't just black and white a person, right? There's a gray area there. And what is that gray area? And how do you really explore and uh, really reveal that in a movie and a story and a script that makes it interesting for people? And, you know, he was, uh, is a master of that. Um, So I completely agree with that. It's like, you know, what is that thing that, you know, makes you feel kind of uncomfortable? You you should look into that as a writer. You know, go go into that, go deep into that, and really uncover. Uh, and you know, if anything, it's some kind of self therapy too as a storyteller oh, yes. and writer. Absolutely, my first <laughs> my first book was a complete therapy session when I wrote my, my own story. It was just like you de- go deep into things, and you, I would skip chapters because I knew where I had to go. Visu- uh, I had to go emotionally to go there. Yeah. Because I was like, I don't want to go there. It was yeah. like a dark corner with a door. I'm like, I don't want to open that door. Yeah. But then, like, when you go in there, you're just like, oh god, I'm in here again. And but that's <laughs> where, but that's where that's where you mine the best stuff. If you look at yeah. any of the, if you look at any successful writer, especially when they're starting out, that's where they start coming out with these kind of things. And maybe later on, you know, after years where they have such a mastery of the craft, they can apply it to any story and kind of still put their taste and flavor on it, but it doesn't have to be as personal. But when you're starting totally. out, 
personal, I mean, the personal story is yeah. or the personal connection. I mean, like we just said with Star Wars, George Lucas, I mean, Darth Vader and, and, and Luke were him and his father mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now wrapped in an insane world. Yeah, wrapped in a, in a world. exactly. But, but there was a chord there that we all can relate to, like, oh, our parents don't understand us to an yeah. extreme extent. <laughs> We just want love and acceptance, I, you know, I mean, not, not for you to kill me with the force, you know, yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. You know, it's it's so universal, like anyone can understand that. Right. And I think that like a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I don't watch like, you know, those fantasy films like, you know, Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter because it's just too out there. And it's like if you look at all of those stories, they are they feel more real you know, to our our ordinary lives more so than, you know, some of the other stories out there that try to be set, you know, that try, that that are set in the real world, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that as storytellers and writers, you just go back to again and again. It's like a lot of these themes are recurring and we want, and especially like during these times, right? With the, when there is so much uncertainty in the world, we want and need storytellers to help us navigate through this crazy, crazy road. Process of life it and process, and process it. it and make us feel feel less alone. Because when you tell those stories and people resonate with it, mm -hmm. you have done, you know, great work in terms of being able to open up people's minds and eyes. And every time they read your book, or watch your movie or play or TV show or experience and walk out with new eyes and see a better world, a more mm -hmm. hopeful world that they want to live in, then you've done your job well. You have helped to transform people's minds and open their minds and eyes into what's possible. And that's exactly what we need to do as storytellers. And is it, it's interesting though, as you were talking, the thing that came into my mind was, when you see these big movies that create these massive worlds, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Star Wars, the reason that those films are successful is not only because they built these beautiful, insane, wonderful worlds, but um, but the characters are so universal. The, the themes are so universal. You know, Avatar and, and mm -hmm. what, Jim, what Jim is doing uh, with... I think he's doing five more. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think so. More. Is it five or th three or five? I don't know, no, no, but it's, it's ambitious. It's, yeah, it's five more. He's yeah. like, I'm gonna. I think I, I heard a quote. He's like, I'm gonna die on Pandora um, <laughs> because he. This is it. This is. He's in the Avatar baking business. He said for the rest of his life. He's yeah, done. Pandora he just, or bust. Yeah. I mean that. This is basically the way it's gonna go. And uh, and come on, we have to mention the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, too. I mean, there's, and, oh my been, gosh, all but that's of been that, immersive. Right? But that's that's been immersive storytelling when Stan Lee created that kind of world back in the comic books. And that's yes. what comic books are. It is very, I mean, it's world building. I mean, comic books yes. are obscenely, that's all they do, but we've never really seen it done in cinema before. Yeah. And, yeah. and what they've been able to do, whether you like them or you don't like them, it, it is, it's world building. I, and, I, and I'll use another example of a more contemporary film, Top Gun. Oh my gosh. Oh I my have I've watched that so far twice in a theater. So, oh my God. So good. One in a, you know, just a whatever normal theater AMC and one in oh. IMAX. And I I have to say when I was, uh, when it was 35 years ago yeah. um, that I went to watch it. I was eight years old and I brought my eight year old son at the time he was eight last year, you know, whenever it came out. And uh, I brought my eight year old son to watch the sequel. And it was amazing. The sequel was way better, you know. Oh my god! Um, so it's, yeah. it's but the te but do you want to talk about immersive storytelling yeah. in a cinematic experience? There's a reason why it's now number six of all time, which is insane for a sequel. Insane. That, which is the longest time it's ever taken to do a sequel in the history of cinema. Thirty six years. Thirty six wow. years for it to do its whole round. And when I was watching it, it's just like you are in 
that world, but you also yeah. are you also care about the characters. And there's also a little nostalgia that, that dabbled in for all us older folk, <laughs> you know. But my kids saw it and they didn't know the first one. I was trying to explain to them the first one. They're like, "Who's Goose?" And I'm like, "What happened to Goose?" I'm like, "Well," and then they see it in the movie. And they're like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. But it, it is. But that's such a really interesting way to look at story what they well, did exactly and you know and that's kind of the um going back to this idea of immersing yourself and transporting you into that world and wanting to be with those characters and wanting the story to never end right and that's the most important thing about immersive storytelling is that once that movie is over or the tv show is over there's a hunger and a need and a desire for people to fulfill their deepest wishes of carrying out, you know, in their hero's footsteps and, you know, whatever they felt like being able to fly like, you know, Tom Cruise, like Maverick, right? Um, being able to be up in the sky and doing all those crazy, the dog fight, all of those things, right? Like, how can you as an immersive storyteller extend that story and continue it so that people can always go back to it um, way after that movie ends or way after the TV show or whatever it is ends, right? How do you think about, you know, doing, um, making games for it? I mean, I remember after watching Top Gun on IMAX, uh, my husband, who's a huge Top Gun fan as well, started, you know, wanting to play with the micro Microsoft simulator. Oh, I remember because he, back in, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, no, 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 the, the, the new one. No, yeah, yeah oh, yeah, yeah. To, yeah, exactly. They have a Top Gun version. I think it's uh, Microsoft Simulator has a Top Gun version, but one of them has a Top Gun version. And so it's being able to, um, you know, continue that, like, going on that journey again and again and again, right? It's so interesting because when I saw Avatar for the first time, and I only seen Avatar in 3D on the theaters, I don't like 3D movies, but when Jim does it, it's done right. So I remember getting, I went and bought the game because I wanted to live, I yes. wanted to go back to Pandora. I wanted to just kind of walk around it and I wanted to be in it and yeah. all of that. And I know there's a Pandora experience at Disney as well. I got to go to it as well. <laughs> but it was just, it was one of those times when I just, he built such a beautiful world mm -hmm. that I wanted to kind of just go in and live in. And yeah. who knows in 10, 15, 20 years, what kind of entertainment will be based off of Star Wars and, and Harry Potter and this kind of stuff and where we're going to be able to go with all of that. It's pretty remarkable as storytellers what we can do. Um, there are no the limits. Yeah, right. There and, are no and, limits, right? And, the, and that's the thing that I think a lot of writers need to understand is I've also seen movies that try to build worlds. Mm -hmm. The movies fail. Yeah, because the story didn't work or the mm -hmm. characters didn't work. They got too busy building up the environment, but they forgot what was really important about the environment. You yes. know, because Star Wars, you can throw that in feudal Japan and it works. Yeah, you yeah. That in the, the Wild Wild West and it works. You know, right? Mandalorian is basically the Wild Wild West in space. I mean, that's basically what Mandalorian. Yeah, and it's uh, a lot of it is like you know understanding what. Um, the character archetypes that people really gravitate towards, but also in that, you know, the journey. In fact, like if you think about the more difficult or challenging the journey is for the character, the more compelling it is for us because we we want to know. It's like, are they going to make it? You know, especially if you've fallen in love with those characters. I mean, my I I I keep bringing up this example because I rewatched it all over again recently with Squid Game. And oh, having oh. all of the characters, every single one of them, you know, all the mm -hmm. main characters, again, some despicable, some likable, you know, uh, most of them despicable and being able to go on that journey with them. They're very, very unique journey. I mean, that movie is so stellar in so many ways, just in Vision. terms of the like cine visually cine cinematography, but the writing and the acting and the directing was just that completely immersed me into that world right to the point where after i had my second run of watching all of the you know the uh first season again i felt like okay 
I want to go out. I want to, I want to experience these games, you know, not to die, but then like, I was about to say, do you want to do red light, green light? Do you want to go to red light, green light? Is that that all right? You and me, Alex, we're going to go to the playground and play red light and green light. Oh my God. Because I remember watching it too. And you want to talk about, is it, it, you, you know, and that was a beauty. The beauty about that story is that it's a world that, I particularly didn't want to go into that world. It yeah. wasn't. I didn't feel like I wanted to go in there personally. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a pretty jacked up world. I don't want to go there. Like, I'll, I'll go to Blade Runner world. I'll go to yeah. Star Wars. I'll go to a bunch of other places, but that's a weird one. <laughs> but you knew that everybody was going to die yeah. except one. Mm-hmm. Who mm-hmm. was the one that was going to make it? And you just really didn't know. Yeah. But every episode got closer and closer. It was just a brutal beauty. Yeah, watching watching that that thing, and and to use another contemporary show that I consider this, I consider the 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 writer one of the best writers in Hollywood right now, Taylor Sheridan. Uh, oh yes, Yellowstone. Yes. I mean, you watch oh, Yellowstone, yeah. and and as I watch Yellowstone, I'm like, do do I want to buy a ranch and, <laughs> and and ride horses now? Is that what I want to do with life? Like because he makes it, he writes it so beautifully and romantically and and even with warts and all i mean it's a pretty brutal show yeah um but it just you're just like man i i think i want i think i need a horse i think i, <laughs> I need i mean i think i need to buy ten thousand acres and just roam free like because it, but it's it, it's inspiring you to want to do something to want to be someone else right and i think a lot of immersive storytelling is that aspirational quality is yeah. that you know not only does it inspire you but you aspire to be like that character or live in that world or live that story whatever it is and that's what stories should be like right like they should have that feeling of i want to i want to experience that i want to i want to walk in someone else's footsteps for a while. I want to experience a place that I've never been to before. And what does that what does that mean to me, you know? And I think being able to think like that is only going to do good in our society. Be having that curiosity and mm-hmm. having that desire to want to expose yourself to different worlds and people and situations and all of this can only make us grow as uh as people so Mm -hmm. i think that that's so important and everyone again like everyone has their own um preferences to what that world is to you know what kind of environment or people they want to be around all the time but it's having that idea that you can live differently um that you can aspire to something better or greater or more like yourself, because let's not forget the people who are actually living their lives and not feeling very good in their own skin and having those worlds or stories expose them to who they truly are. So I think that that's also extremely interesting for people, you know, if they design an avatar for themselves and they're like, that's that is what I want to look like, you know, And, and that's the basis of cosplay. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yeah. where you go to a comic book convention. And and I remember taking my wife to my first comic book convention dec- a decade ago, and she was fascinated by grown adults dressed yeah. as superheroes. Yeah. And she would stop them. And I'm like, what do you do for a living? She's like, I'm an attorney. <laughs> I'm a doctor. And like, and like really? Great. like Yeah, we just do this on the weekends because we love it. But it's a way to feel like you're in that story. You're trying there. That's their attempt to be part of the story that means so much to them. Story right. is such a powerful thing. We we as human beings can't live without story. It is part of our, it's is I wouldn't say it's as important as water and food, but after water and food and shelter and the other key things, sure, yeah, without yeah. Without story, we don't function. I mean, no. even if it's if even it's to tell you, hey, um John just died around the corner because there was a tiger there. That's a story that helps us survive. Exactly. And this it is was what, yeah. yeah. It was a survival mechanism. It was a way for us to communicate. Don't go to that part of the woods or wherever, right? right. Um, it's the a way for- you. The witch you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was cautionary tales. A lot of the children's fairy tales started off as cautionary, but then it became inspirational, aspirational, and entertaining and all of these things. But stories serve so much, so many different purposes, but ultimately it's really a reflection of ourselves and, you know, wanting to- um, experience uh, different worlds and stories that help us to understand who we are and why we're here. Amen, sister. Amen. Preach. Preach. 
<laughs> now I'm going to ask you, Mark, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests, what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? Keep writing. I know that a lot of uh, writers are waiting for the magical phone call, um, but that magical phone call does not happen unless you work for it. <laughs> so writers, you got to write. And even if you're not getting paid for it, you got to write, um, you know, your whatever it is, like if you're going to write a book or a play or a script uh, for feature film or TV, write something you're super passionate about. Don't worry about who's going to buy this or read this or any of that. Write the story. If there's only one story that you got to tell before you die, write that story. That's my advice. So that when someone does come knocking on your door, and you want to share that story, then that's the perfect time to do it. Um, and you got to you gotta write. I think that that's something, you know, I meet a lot of young people who are like, I'm going to be a writer one day. And I'm like, what are you writing now? And they're like, oh, I haven't written anything for a while. Writers write. You got to write. <laughs> that's yep, my yeah, advice. Absolutely. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Oh boy. Wow. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, you, you know, one of the best lessons that I keep learning again and again, and one that I, you know, yeah, I didn't learn until like maybe into my thirties or something that as you rise up, you got to bring people up with you. Um, and I think that that's so true. And I have had a lot of mentors in my life and I see how they do that. And I'm starting to realize that how important that is, that when you do find success in whatever you do, you got to bring people with you, the people's, the people that you like, the people that you trust, you know? Um, and I think that you got to give back, you got to give back what you got. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of, you know, when you're first starting out, it's you often think about, you know, me, 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 and how do I get ahead, all of that stuff? And how do I get to the top by stomping on people or whatever it is? You know, <laughs> I think that that's that's not how the world works. You know, be kind, be gracious, be generous um, and be generous with what you know and, you know, who you know. And I think that that's something that um, I always remind myself of, you know, every day, no matter, you know, what I'm doing. I think that you got to treat people, you got to treat people right. And three of your favorite films of all time. Oh no, don't ask me that. <laughs> oh my God. Three of that come to mind today. You won't be on your gravestone. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, I mean, I, there's so many movies that I go back to again and again. Um, I mean, recently I've been, you know, I, I was, I rewatched this, uh, I mean, Mad Max Fury, Fury Road. Oh, so oh good. my God. So good. <laughs> so, so good. And did I you see the black I, and white version. Oh no, I didn't actually. You have to watch but, the black oh, and white version. Okay. I, oh, okay. I'll have to so watch epic. the epic. black and white. Okay. Okay. But I read the book on the making of the movie and everything. I was just like, Holy moly, like all the various things that had to happen for this movie to even exist was a miracle in itself. It didn't even have um, a script. It like had storyboards. <laughs> yeah, it's like, crazy. It's just, <laughs> it's just craziness. And that is, it was, a. Uh, I felt like it was creativity, unbridled creativity. You know, there was just the costuming and like the makeup and just some of the, the words that people were saying. It's like, what is this, right? And, but and it was I, a beautiful, chaotic mess. Like, I, I mean, it wasn't a mess at all. It was beautiful. Um, and the thing, yeah. the thing I love about that is like, from the director of Happy Feet, <laughs> from the Oscar winning director of Happy Feet comes Max, <laughs> Mad, Mad Max Fury Road. Like, what is going on? <laughs> Who would have known? So Who true. <laughs> so true. Oh, my gosh. Um but Charlize Theron is amazing in it. And like, I mean, she can play anything, but she was really mm -hmm. great in it. Uh, two more. Do I have to say two more? Oh, my gosh. There's so many. Um, you know, I like one of the movies that I rewatched over and over again when uh, I was in high school and co well, college, I think, was uh, Chunking Express by Wong Kar Wai. Mm. And it was such it was so beautiful and quiet. 
Um, but I love the character development. I love just just how it was such a there's simple stories about everyday characters, you know, and that also reminds me of um, uh, Lost in Translation, too, like mm-hmm. that I can watch over and over again as well. So, so many. I mean, All right. you know, we'll t- we'll I, the, I, it's I, I won't way torture too you. hard. I'll, 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 I won't torture you anymore. Uh, Margaret, where can people find uh, your new book? Uh, so as of yesterday, my book is available everywhere. Amazon, Target, in your uh, local bookstores. I, I think that I'll, I'll definitely available online um, in your local bookstores. So um, really anywhere and hopefully anywhere. So uh, immersive storytelling for real and imagined worlds, a writer's guide. And I'm actually having a book signing if you're in Pasadena, California, on September 9th at 7 p.m. in the Vroman's Bookstore in Pasadena, too. So it'll be really great to see some people there as well. Margaret, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and thank you for building these worlds that we're walking in and experiencing and uh, and inspiring future storytellers uh, of the future. So I appreciate you, my dear. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank you so much, Alex, for having me. It was really fun talking to you. 